Everybody. My name is Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here, Bel Air Campus Pastor, and uh, it's just good to be together. Uh, special welcome if you're a guest, if you're a visitor. Uh, shout out to everybody over at Edgewood and Bel Air. Let's wave at the people on the treadmills up there. Hello. Uh, excited about Abingdon, and it's just a cool time to be a part of Mountain and all the amazing things God is doing among us. I also want to say hello if you're watching online. Uh, maybe you're traveling on this holiday weekend and uh, just streaming the service or catching it later. And we give thanks today for the freedom that we have and the religious freedom we have in this country. We remember those who made sacrifices to make that happen, and we wish for that same kind of freedom for everybody, everywhere. Uh, so we just celebrate and remember that. I hope you'll do that as you, as you enjoy uh, the day off tomorrow. And... Um, I just want to say, to begin, I know something about y'all. I know something about each one of you, actually. Uh, it's a pretty, um, pretty intense thing. I actually know the thing that you crave most in this life. And some of y'all are sitting there going, whatever, no, he does not. And then some of you are like, no, he doesn't wait, does he? Like, <laughs> does he really know that about me? Um, I don't know what you think it is, okay, Maybe you think what you crave most is uh, success or fame or fortune. Uh, maybe it is a vacation or an escape of some kind or, or just rest, uh, an adventure, right? See the world. Maybe uh, for those of us doing the whole life challenge, I know what it is. It's carbs. It's cheese. That's what I crave right now and bread uh, or maybe chocolate. Maybe the thing you crave is sex. You think that's what you crave most or a spouse or a companion. Um, here's what I think the answer is to what you crave most in this life because it's also what I crave most in this life and I think it's what every human being has ever, that has ever lived craves most deeply and that's this, connection, connection. If you think about it, we are designed, we're created to connect on a deep level. Uh, the evidence of this is everywhere. Let's just look at a few examples. One, newborn babies. The first thing, the first thing they do is they cry out, they reach out, right? They're like, they wanna just connect. I have two daughters, they're young, they're in school, and uh, they come home and they're like, so-and-so is my best friend forever, right? And then a couple days later, it's like a different name is like, so this other person is now my best friend. And, and like it keeps changing, right? And they're, they're always starting these little clubs and groups. And, and I think that's evidence of just this thing inside of us that wants to connect. Think about pets, okay? All you dog people, okay? Um, I, know you, I know you just need, because you're insecure, you just need that constant affirmation. You know, you need somebody just looking at you all the time like you're the greatest, you haven't arrived at a level where you can sort of have a more sophisticated relationship like what we have with cats, you know? Um, now, I really like dogs and cats, but I, feel like I, I do feel like I have to stick up for cats around here. Okay, but for real, dog people, like I see every day of my life, you'll have to explain this to me, I see these stickers that say, I love certain kind of dog. It's on your car, like for the world to see. Like I love dachshunds, right? Um, what, what's up with that? Like who cares, right? <laughs> Like, do you think, what do you think is gonna happen? Like, somebody's gonna see that and be like, follow that car, those are my people, you know? Like some dad riding around with his son, like, son, boy, look, that right there, that's our kind of people. Boy, we're, we're wiener dog people, that's what we are. <laughs> Don't you ever forget it. Anyway, uh, Instagram, okay, we post pictures, blogging, Twitter, these kind of things. Why do we post videos and photos for, for the world to see. Part of it is because we want far-flung 
loved ones, friends and relatives to stay connected to our life, right? And I think there's also an aspect of it of just like see me, know me, right? Um, sports, they're all about connection. We play on teams and a huge part of the experience is the connection we have with each other or when we pull for the same team, right? We see an O sticker or a Raven sticker or whatever on a car and you're like, okay, yeah, you know, there's a connection there or whatever. Um, music, right? What is a great song if, it not, if not a way to connect with our feelings, a way to connect with uh, some memory, some time in our past, to connect with our, our faith or what we believe, how we see the world, connect with each other, That's a large part of what music is about. Our culture is obsessed with romance, right? Some of you don't raise your hands, please, but some of you actually watch shows like The Bachelor, The Bachelorette, Uh, I don't get it, but um, we're obsessed with the connection that happens between people, or just sex. Our culture is obsessed with sex, and you're wondering right now, oh gosh, what picture is he gonna put out? Like, don't, (laughs) I'm not putting a picture up for this one. But it's the most powerful way, really, that two human beings can connect. And it is never just a a physical thing, no matter what you've been told. There's a spiritual aspect to it. And irreversible things happen. Uh, Stories that that draw us in, stories that we love on the screen or in books or whatever, um, they're they're about connection. I recently watched the, the new, the Guardians of the Galaxy 2, the new one. And it's this crazy cast of characters. They're aliens from different planets and stuff. But part of what's interesting about the story is they're all flawed and they're all just really a bunch of weirdos looking for love, looking for a deep connection, looking for acceptance and community, kind of like you and me. And by the way, if you're looking at that and you're like, oh my gosh, what a strange looking bunch of creatures. You should, we should trade places right now, okay? (laughs) Um, How about this? How about this for evidence? Uh, You're sitting in a church right now why? why? Like, why are you here? There's probably a variety of reasons, but I think, and I think this is supported by the scriptures all throughout, that the main reason might be that you are searching for a deep connection that is just, it's just in you. There's this drive, there's this thing inside all of us where we are created to know and to be known. That, that is, there's a vertical aspect of that in our lives with God and us. And then on the plane of human interaction, horizontal relationships, we are created to know and to be known by other people. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. We're wrapping up this Everybody Matters series and it's been really great, I think. Uh, I, we're just learning how to get healthy, healthier, together, and we're talking about how that is a a spiritual thing and a physical thing, and those two can't really be separated like we often try to do. Um, Christianity is a decidedly physical faith, right? There's, uh, we live these lives in our bodies. There's no separating uh, our body and our spirit, so to speak, in in our experience. So we're doing this thing called the Whole Life Challenge, and it's been really good for me. Um, it's helping me to develop some better habits. It's not too late to sign up. You can still sign up uh, for the next few days until Wednesday, and there's lots of scholarships available if, you, if the, the money part is what's holding you back. I just love how it has sort of gamified the act of, of getting healthier and helping us to help each other to do that. So we're trying to eat better, sleep better, think better, uh, and uh, move better, exercise and stretching and that kind of stuff. And originally, that's when we started playing the series, we were like, okay, the healthy living is like, yeah, how we eat, how we sleep, how we move, and uh, how we think. Yeah, that's it. And then we quickly realized, no, 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 no. There's another component that's really, really important as we look at God's definition of health, and that is the word for today, connect. Eat, sleep, think, move, connect. Because one, the f- one fact is, if you are gonna try to do those other things better, you're not gonna get very far if you try to do them just purely by yourself. That, that very rarely, if ever, works out in the, in the long term for healthy living. And, and sort of the flip side of that coin is maybe you do feel like you're, you're just crushing it at all four of those other things right now in your life, but you're doing that alone. The fact is, you are still not healthy according to God, and according to what I think we, we will see 
in our lives and in the, in, the, in the word of God. So how we connect our willingness to know and be known, it's just, it's every bit as important to our health as how we eat, uh, exercise, how we think, and our rest and all of that. And in fact, in some ways, it's the one that ties all these other ones together. So just think about it. There's a, there's a growth, constant growth in, uh, in group training. Like even in the physical world, like CrossFit gyms are popping up everywhere. And that's not just about the exercise. That is about community. It's about encouragement. It's about accountability, right? Uh, if you, you know, I've come uh, under the influence recently of a guy named Kurt Thompson, and he's a counselor and an author and a therapist and a scientist, and a, he's a Christian guy. And uh, I recommend his book, Anatomy of the Soul, if you wanna dig deeper and kind of nerd out on some of this stuff. He talks about neurobiology and how our brains are, are rewire themselves and how that relates to some of what the Bible tells us. And he talks about this thing called interpersonal neurobiology, right? And th- what he's saying is, the, the mind, the soul, the center and essence of kind of who a person is, is actually a confluence, a combination of our brain and our experience in the world with other people. Connect. He says, I believe our lives will be abundant, joyful, and peaceful only to the degree that we are engaged, known, and understood by one another. And I agree with that. Maybe you've heard the saying, uh, it was uh, credited, so, credited to a guy named Jim Rohn, he's like a motivational speaker. At, at one point he said, you know, each person is basically becoming the average of the five people that they're, most close, they're closest to in life. You're, you sort of become who you are with. And we say, we say these kind of things to our kids, right? We're like, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And so in theory and the, logically, this all just makes sense. What about in our experience? Well, for me personally, I just know that it's true. How I eat has been influenced uh, for good and for bad by the people I'm hanging out with. Lately, it's been mostly good. I have all these friends that are like eating vegetables and going to the farm and you know organic and this, and, and it sort of draws me in that direction, right? It's a good thing. Um, They've watched all those documentaries on Netflix that are all about how, you know, bad things that we eat and all these bad habits. I have not watched any of them yet, resisted, but I've added them all to my list, okay? So I've indicated interest in potentially watching them. Uh, We know this about how we think, right? Who you hang out with, who you're around, very much influences how you think, how you see the world, what kind of information you're taking in. Uh, How we move, for me, I've just never been one who's very good at just going off and doing my own thing exercise-wise, go run, go, go work out. I don't enjoy that, but I love to play ball. I love sports, and so I need accountability. I need teammates, and I've found a rhythm now with a group of guys I play basketball with a couple times a week, and I know that they're, they're depending on me to show up, right? There's, there's some, uh, some connection there that matters, and it draws me out and gets me healthier. So I just know Yes, when my diet, my exercise, my sleep, my thought life are out of whack, that, that I'm not healthy, but I think that as I've reflected this week, the times that I am maybe the least healthy are the times when I'm out of whack relationally, when I am off, when I'm lacking the proper connections with God and with other people in my life and I'm failing or just avoiding that central human process of knowing and being known. And I don't know if you've ever thought about that or maybe you disagree or or don't wanna admit it or what, but I just think that's probably true of of all of us. I really do. This is also true in in the theological realm. If you you wanna think about what God has to say about this, it goes all the way back in our story as the people of God. In Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible, God, it says God created the heavens and the earth. He, he created everything. And, and he, he kind of topped it off by creating this human being in his image. And then he says, Genesis 2.18, it says, Yahweh God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And so, and that word helper, by the way, doesn't mean subordinate like women are somehow lesser. It means a companion. It means someone with whom to connect and to to go through life together. It has always been about 
that for us as humans. We can go back even further than Genesis. Actually, if you just look at God, who God is and what we believe as Christians, we believe in this mystery called the Holy Trinity, right? We believe that God exists, one God in sort of in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and there's this mutuality among them, and we see this uh, as, so there's a, a painting uh, by Rublev that sort of illustrates it, uh, I think we're gonna see there, and this, they sort of, each one submits to the other, and it shows that at God's very essence of even who he is, that there is um, connection and relationship and community. So how could you or I ever expect to be healthy by God's definition if we're trying to do that on our own? It just doesn't make sense. So in preparation for this sermon, I spent some time in 1 Corinthians, which is a letter from the Apostle Paul to this church at Corinth, and he's writing to them. They have all these issues and struggles going on in their community, and it sort of becomes this letter that's like his sort of what he has to say about life and community. And so check this out. Uh, there's this metaphor of, that we've hit on in the last few weeks a little bit about how we are the temple of God in this world, right? So 1 Corinthians chapter six says this. And by the way, um, I always talk about, how, I like to talk about how you comes through uh, poorly in English from the Hebrew and the Greek because we don't know if it's singular or plural and we ought to have y'all in there. You've heard me talk about this before maybe. Well, the, the yous here and the yours are, uh, most of them are italicized, they're plural. And uh, so just, you can think about that as y'all, you all, okay, you plural. So it says, do y'all not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you together, whom you have received from God? You all are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, God, therefore honor God with your bodies. And so we see, it says, your bodies are temples, where'd it go? This is the one, temples of the Holy Spirit. And so we usually interpret this to say, um, each one of us individually is sort of a little temple of the Holy Spirit, so we need to take care of ourselves, and, and that's right, that's true. That's usually the way we think about this, but there's another aspect to this as well. So back in 1 Corinthians chapter three, it says this, don't you all know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred and you all together are that temple. So while the Bible says that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit of God, it also says that we are the home and the place where the Holy Spirit dwells, us as a community. There's a mutuality and a connection there that's really, really important. It's both and. Then in chapter 12, this is one of the places where Paul uses this metaphor, this other metaphor of the body itself to describe us, to describe the church. Uh, we talk about it as the body of Christ. And so maybe a familiar passage if you grew up in church, maybe not, but listen to some of this. He says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it's the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good, purpose, the common good. And I just gotta say, everyone here has unique gifts and talents that God has given us. And now is the time, if you're a part of this church, to step up, new campuses, new things happening. It's time to start putting your gifts to work among us. And, and so he just goes on, he says, just as one body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. We were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, black or white, whatever kind of you know, labels we wanna use to separate ourselves, he says, and we were all given the one spirit to drink, even so the body is not made up of one part, but many. And he talks about the different parts, how they're all important, right? They're all different. He says the foot doesn't go around whining about not being the hand. Ear doesn't wish it were an eye. If the whole body were just a giant version of any one part, it, that would be awful. It wouldn't work, but God has made, he has made the parts all different intentionally because he then put, a t put them together to work together like a human body. I'm gonna sw switch over to the message translation 
here, and listen to this. I like the way I said it. It says, but I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or gigantic hand wouldn't be a body, but a monster. We, what we have is one body with many parts, each its proper size and in its proper place. No part is important just on its own. That's hard for us to hear in our culture, which celebrates individuality, and we're all just, you know, everybody's so special and, and unique, and that is true. There's other things in Scripture that talk about that, but it says that matters only in the context of our connection with each other. Can you imagine eye telling hand, get lost, I don't need you, or head telling foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice, it works the other way. The lower the part, the more basic, and therefore necessary. So one of the interesting things here is uh, I always thought growing up that Paul sort of, you know, he's brilliant. He, he made up this metaphor and like, wow, yeah, the church is like, the, like a human body. That was actually a common metaphor at the time, but it was used differently. So it was always used to sort of rank people and to, to raise yourself up and to push others down and to say, I am like the eye, you know, I am like this really important, beautiful part of the body. And you're like the, you know, the guts or the whatever other part they wanted to say that's yucky and less important. And it was used in that way. But Paul takes this common thing and he flips it on his head and he says, no, 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 all parts have equal value and they're all important. And in fact, he says, some, the ones that you don't see that don't get celebrated and honored are actually deserving of higher honor in some ways. He says, you can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's a part of your own body you're concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion to full-bodied hair? And I'm like, amen. <laughs> amen. The way, he, listen to this, the way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. Listen to this again. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together. It's about connection, right? Now, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Many of you are familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the love chapter, the one you hear at weddings, right? Um, I'm not gonna read it today, um, but I just want you to know that's, that's the context. 1 Corinthians 13 flows right out of 1 Corinthians 12. So it's not, it wasn't written for weddings. It wasn't written just for married couples. It's written for all of us. So when he talks about, when he says, you know, if we are working perfectly together, if we're like a well-oiled machine, if we're like a, a perfect high-performance athlete's body, just, just working so well, but we do that without love, it's useless. It's, it's like a bunch of useless noise. He says, on the other hand, love, God's kind of love is patient and it's kind, right? It does not boast. It does not keep any record of wrongs. It's not easily angered. It always protects. It always trusts. And I want you to think about those things. They make no sense in isolation. They only make sense in community, where exactly is all this stuff playing out? It's playing out and it's practiced in our lives with other people. And there's echoes of this all throughout the New Testament. Do a little study sometime, like we say sometimes, on the one another's. Just search for the word, the phrase each other or one another and look at all the things that we're called to in our life together. Read a book called Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a little, great little classic Christian work that um, it talks about this stuff. You know, <clears throat> It, it just makes sense on all these different levels, including what God has to say. We, if you wanna be healthy, you need 
the right kind of connections. You need to connect in the right ways with God and with your true self and with each other, with other human beings. So if that's true, how do we do it, right? Okay, what's what's a way to do that? So I wanna give you guys a practical tool that's helped me in my life and ministry. We just call it by the names uh, Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy, some Bible characters. So we'll say Paul represents this one, and I'm just gonna draw a little gas gauge, empty and full, and this is the Barnabas one, okay? And uh, then we have Timothy down here. And uh, so another way you could do it also, I thought about for the, for the tech savvy, for the young people, is you could do like the battery, okay? It's like your, your level, your charge level. Okay, so um, think about Paul as representing people who are pouring into you. People you're learning from, they're further, further along than you on the journey, maybe they're wise. And uh, there are people that you're kind of getting something from and they're coaching you in life, okay? And so you like check, just every now and then just stop and check your level. How am I doing? So maybe you're saying, you know, I got a lot of that right now. I go to church, I learn great stuff. I'm, uh, God, I'm in a, learning in these classes or I have these mentoring relationships or whatever. Got a lot of Paul in my life. Barnabas represents your peers, your buds, your, your, those who are kind of at your level and kind of on the journey with you right, who are you doing that with? And Timothy is then who are you investing in? Who are you sharing what you have learned with? Who are you pouring into? And we need, ideally, we would just have a high level of all these in our life, right, just full. But oftentimes that's not the case in life, so you stop every now and then and you sort of check, how am I doing on each of these? And so maybe you're saying, okay, I need some Paul, right? I need some of that. How do you, how do you ask for that? Here's how you don't, here's how you don't, seek that out. Don't go to somebody and say, would you mentor me? That's a scary question, right? Uh, and those people you're asking are probably busy. They probably have a lot going on. Uh, that sounds like, will you, you know, adopt me, <laughs> reparent me? Um, just do this. Say, hey, I admire you, and I think I have some things to learn from you. Could I take you to lunch? Could I uh, take you to coffee and ask you a few questions? And then you do that with some, be prepared with some great questions and see what grows from there, Right? Seek out learning and mentoring, even from books and, and podcasts and that kind of thing. Um, if you need some Timothy in your life, so you're like, okay, I got a lot of Paul and I got good friends along the way, but I'm not sharing it. I'm not giving anything, right? Um, I need to pour into some younger people, whatever. Here's what you don't do. Don't go like hang out, lurk outside of a high school or something. <laughs> like don't drive around in a van and be like, hey, little kid, can I teach you some stuff? Don't do it. <laughs> don't do that. Here's what you do. You sign up to help in student ministry or Mountain Kids ministry, and they'll background check you too. Um, you, you know, you invest like Boys and Girls Club. What, there's opportunities, Epicenter. There's lots of ways to do this kind of thing. So get your get your Timothy going in your life, so you're not. It's not just ending with you, right? I was going to share with you guys um, on the Barnabas thing. Um, so I was at a retreat recently led by this, uh, this guy, Kurt Thompson, that I mentioned, and he kept talking about who are three people in your life who know everything. Between the three of them, they know everything about you. And I was like, wow. And he kept talking about like your cloud of witnesses, sort of your circle, your inner circle. And he said, who's in there? Who's really deep in there in terms of this knowing and being known thing? And he challenged on that, and I was like, you know, in my life in the past, I could have easily answered that question, but right now I said, I very quickly was like, well, Aaron's in there, my wife, she's right there, solidly inside. And I was like, who else, you know, really knows me, really checks in on me, really, I'm doing the same for them? And I was like, so I was blessed to think of like 15, 20 people in my life who are like right around the edges. And they maybe got a leg and an arm sticking in there, you know? They're maybe right here. But I, I was like, I, I used to have that and I don't have that in my life right now. On a surface level, I have a lot of Barnabas, but on this deep level that we're trying to get at, I lack that now. And this doing this exercise was like, I gotta, I gotta make that happen, right? I gotta move in that direction. I have to invite some people in. And that's, that's not easy always. It's awkward. It's hard for, sometimes for guys especially. But we have to go there. We have to know and be known if, if it's true that this connect thing is that important. And all of this under the umbrella of your primary relationship with God. 
So I wanna ask you, what, you know, where, do this exercise with yourself and with others and say, all right, where do, what do I need to do? What's my next step? Maybe you need to invite some other people in in some way. Uh, maybe, on, maybe it's on this health journey. You need to walk with people. You need to work out together. You need a meal plan together. Maybe you need to, I, I, I think a lot of people need to get off the internet and get into real human relationships. Dive back into the awkward, difficult world of human interaction because it's really easy to just not. And you may be 25 or you may be 65 hearing me say that and knowing that it's true. Some of us need to uh, just join a club or a team to connect with some other people, uh, put yourself out there. Some of us need to invite people for dinner, invite people into our home, throw a party for your neighbors. You know, many of us need to step up into a serving team at church, uh, into a group. We always talk about groups. We have all these small groups and mid-sized groups, and this is the point, connecting with God and with each other. And our summer study this year is gonna be called Relatable, and it's gonna look at some of the different relationships in our life. And that's a simple way to just plug in with some other people. We'll do that at all our campuses, and uh, you need to know and be known. You're created for it. And it's not necessarily gonna just happen. Not even if you sign up for a small group and show up and be like, all right, where, when is this intimacy thing gonna happen? You have to participate. You have to put yourself out there. You have to be vulnerable and get real. There are so many great stories about this. And I was reminded of one from our church just yesterday or the day before. Um, years ago, my friend George and his wife, they joined a small group. They're like, all right, we're gonna try this, right? And it was six couples. And they started meeting, and George started, they, they actually had a daughter at the time who was struggling with drug addiction. And George just started sharing it in the group, and he said his wife was kicking him under the table, like, shut up, like, stop sharing this. And they talked about it, and he was like, look, why, we gotta be real, right? Why are we even doing this if we're just gonna go put on some fake, you know, happy face? So they shared, and this is a cool thing, the cool kind of thing that God does. So none of them knew this going into the group, but of the six couples, five of the six at that time had teenage or young adult kids that were dealing with drug addiction. And it was, it was killing them all, and it made all the difference in the world for them to be able to be real about it and share with some other people. And God started healing them and doing amazing things as they walked through that together, and they became a part of the beginning of this celebrate recovery ministry, which is this, as you already heard, this Friday celebrating 11 years of just helping and healing a lot of people. So that's, that's beautiful, but get, you and I need to go get our own stories. We need to put ourselves in a place where God can do something like that for us. And I just pray that he will reveal a very clear next step for each one of us this week, maybe even today, as we talk about how we can connect with God and with each other, because it's really, really important. If this is true, that we are the body of Christ, if that's actually true, we are his flesh and blood and his hands and feet in this world, then we have a huge job to do, right? We have a huge responsibility. You guys know, okay, this world right now is in many ways more connected than ever through technology, through the internet, through travel, but you know also that in many ways this world is as disconnected, disjointed, divided, angry, lonely, scared, as ever. So who has the answer? We have the answer. It's called the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And we have the ability and the responsibility to share this with other people and to connect with them and to show them how to have healthy connections with God and with other human beings. So who's gonna do that? Is it gonna be it's not gonna be me, it's not gonna be you, it's not gonna be Ben, it's gonna be us. That's how it happens, that's how God has designed it to happen. This other thing that, um, that Kurt Thompson said on that retreat has really stuck with me. He said, you know, there's actually no such thing as love, in a sense of like, hand me, hand me a box full of love, right? <laughs> He said, there's no such thing as love. There are only embodied acts of love. 
embodied acts of love. And I, and I think that's true. And I think that's also true as we wrap up this series about health and faith and you know wholeness, goodness, peace. There's no such thing as any of those things. That you, like put it in my hand. There are only embodied acts of them. And so if we're gonna live this out, If this is gonna be more than five weeks of talking about being healthy, we have to live it out in our bodies, in our individual lives, and in the body that is our community. We have to live it out in our families, in our work, in our sports teams, in our cities and towns, in our friend groups, and certainly here in the church because we believe that every body really does matter. So if that sounds good to you, I just wanna challenge you to stay in it. Stay in the flow of what God's doing here. And uh, we're gonna sing a song in a few moments about the word amen. We think about that, uh, we're gonna say the word amen a lot. And we we think about that word as like an ending word, like okay, now I can eat, right? The blessing's over. And it is that, but it's also a word that propels us forward because amen, what it really just means is like yes, Yes, with like 17 exclamation points. And it it means, so be it. It means, may it be so. May it continue to be so. May it be more so. God, this is what we desire and this is what we proclaim with our lives. So if you want this to be something that keeps rolling, health and wholeness, and that includes connection with God and each other, then sing and shout your amen as we get ready to sing right after I say amen uh, to a closing prayer. Join me in a prayer if you would. God of love, we are thankful for who you are and for your your great love, which shows us that everybody matters and that our bodies are your home and our community is your home. So Lord, help us to just more fully understand that and to live into it. Lord, show us how to truly know and be known. Give us the courage that we need and the compassion that we need. Lord, help us to connect with you, with ourselves, and with others in the right ways and to just honor you with our lives. Lord, we, and we say, may it be so. May we be healthy and whole and full of your love in every sense. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.